Hello everyone, welcome to today's meet, uh, to today's webinar on PhD related to chemical engineering. Uh, so today's speakers are Dr. Chalaka Chaudhary and uh, Dr. Chalaka Barlewal and uh, Dr. Neha uh, Chaudhary. And both are Bits uh, Pilani LMS who, uh, who graduated in chemical engineering. We have uh, Dr. Shalaka, who did her uh, PhD from the University of Wisconsin in chemical and biological engineering, and Dr. Sneha, who did her MS from University of Delft, Netherlands, and her PhD from uh, the University of Berlin, and she is currently working as a consultant, while Shalaka is working as an extrusion uh, scientist. Um, so, uh, welcome to the webinar, Shalaka and Sneha. Hey, Supriya. Thank you for hosting this. It's a great opportunity for us to share our learnings and uh, share whatever we have to inspire new kids. It's, it's our pleasure. And many of my own friends requested this webinar. So, yeah, let's get started. So, my first question is that um, as an undergraduate student, what made you go for a PhD or MS? And what should be the motivation for any candidate who is aspiring for a PhD or MS? Uh, can see how you start answering it, of course. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so firstly, thanks a lot for the introduction and for the opportunity for us to share our experiences here, I think. Um, so regarding your question, I think the biggest motivation to go ahead for, a, for an MS or PhD should actually be your interest in pursuing or dedicating, let's say, five to six years of your time to a particular subject area that you want to specialize in. For instance, for me, it was I wanted to go ahead and work in nanotechnology and um, and really explore the area at a much greater depth. And that was pretty much what I did for my master's and then also for my PhD moving forward. So um, beyond everything else, I mean, beyond all the job prospects or academic prospects that you might have after PhD, the biggest motivation should be, or the biggest question that you should ask yourself is, am I willing to dedicate the next five, six years into studying a topic in greater depth? Or uh, would I rather you know, go start working already in a company and start earning a lot more money because uh, if if you're if you're not up for specializing yourself, I think it's going to be a big uphill battle uh, trying to get through your MS and PhD programs, which are usually quite uh, uh, let's say quite intensive from a, a lo study load perspective and uh, and also from the amount of work that you have to put in. Yeah, and uh, yeah, if you want to continue, can you please go ahead? No, mm, I think that that's what my point is basically to to have the motivation to pursue a subject at greater depth and to dedicate that much time for it so uh dr shalaka do you have something to add to it like motivated you to you know go for a phd or ms uh i think for me it was a different uh path if if People from Pits uh, Hyderabad, I'm not sure if they're on this call, but in general, for chemical engineers, there is usually scarcity of jobs. The, the number of companies which come for our recruitments on campus, they're typically very few. And so in your third year, you go through the process. Do you still want to look for a job and prepare yourself for it? Or is there a plan B? Uh, and most of the people, I would say, at that time with me, uh, we're thinking of taking this plan B as an option. Let's just go ahead and think of doing a master's. Uh, I was the other option which most of the other people take is start going through their CS courses that you took in your first year and prepare yourself for a, for an IT job, a low paying IT job. As Sneha said very clearly, you should really know what you really like. Like, it's is it chemical engineering or no chemical engineering? I was very clear. I want to do something in chemical engineering. I loved what I was doing in my third year. I was passionate about the courses. I was interested in what really it has, it can provide. And that's where I decided either it's MS or I will look for a job in chemical engineering itself. Like, there were very few companies which were coming to the campus, but then why not? So... Uh, slowly, you start getting into the process. I, in my third year, I started learning more about the professors, more learning more about what MS really is, masters really is, PhD really is, and that's when I realized it's not a bad option. Let's just go for it rather than looking for a job. 
and that's my journey specifically but i think as she said very clearly you should really know what you really want to do it's it's a very intensive process it's easy it it seems much easier when you start applying for it but then you go through it for 5 years to 7 years that's when you need to keep your motivation up and, and it's it's all about self motivation after a point <laughs> Absolutely. I think I can, I can add a bit more to what Shalaka said in the sense that when you're going for your master's and PhD, it's very differently structured, I guess, in the Western countries as compared to that in India, obviously. Uh, at, until your bachelor's, you're pretty much focusing on getting grades, studying the courses, pretty much in some courses, you have questions coming up right from your exercises and tutorials. And, and in master's and PhD, it's a very different ballgame altogether. It's about structuring unstructured problem statements and trying to research and find out the answers to it. And you should consider this in the following way if you really like to do research if you really like to solve problems and uns and basically unstructured problems thrown at you and you're willing to give your time into understanding it at greater depths rather than just focusing on getting the grade for it that's exactly when you should think okay yeah ms or phd is probably the right career path for you that being said also to add to the career prospects of it um when i was back in my bachelor's uh, i was at the at the stage in my final year when i finished one semester early and the campus told me you can only come back to campus during placements but uh, you cannot really stay for the last semester on campus and uh, i thought well if i have to take placements i really need to see what companies are coming in and i wanted to work in the r&d in the initial stages and most of the big chemical companies like basf or whatever you know of or like shell would probably prefer a phd or in at least a master student for the R&D positions and that's something uh, that kind of made me think okay yeah if i really want to get into these companies that's probably the best path to choose and because i realized i love research so much um, and i'm willing to do it so that was my biggest decision making point i think where i thought yeah it's the best way to go okay so uh moving forward to the application process could you uh, so uh, i'll start off with uh, dr sneha that uh, when you were applying to uh, like a uh, uni uh, university uh, for your ms to uh, the university in netherlands like what were the application pro what were the steps involved in the application process and what are the prerequisites that are required for applying for a ms or phd Mm -hmm. um, I think I will try to keep my answer a little broad here and talk about both Netherlands and Germany um, rather than just focusing on Netherlands. So uh, I did not apply uh, to a lot of universities in the Netherlands. I mean, in Europe, uh, Delft was the only place I had applied to because I knew I had a sure shot chance there given the seniors who I had spoken to from bits. Um, the procedure, uh, the pro procedure was really simple in the sense that you needed to submit your GRE and TOEFL grades and, and recommendations, very similar to the American universities in the process. The difference being that your grades, your uh, bachelor, sorry, your bachelor's grades have a lot of uh, weightage here, and there's a, a certain cutoff that uh, Netherlands has for the uh, for the masters admit. Like I think it's around seven point five or something at least uh, that you need to have, and. Uh, I would say compared to the US universities, getting into TU Delft is relatively simple, also compared to the German universities. But surviving in TU Delft is a challenge because, uh, and I know I say this is a challenge because people tend to fail courses and, and fail, failing is not a concept known to Indians. It's very alien. You think, oh, whoa, if I'm failing, it's a big taboo. Uh, but it's really not. People fail courses because the courses are structured in a way where things are very intense. You need to learn a lot of material in a period of 10 weeks time. And uh, and if you're not regular with your studies, which we Indians tend not to do, just cram up before our T1s and T2s, um, you really need to be regular in your studies there if you want to pass the course. And it's less about getting the grades and more about really learning the subject and understanding it. So that's exactly what makes uh, surviving in TU Delft quite difficult. But um, the admission in itself is not uh, super difficult if you have good grades in your bachelor's and, and decent TOEFL and GRE scores and recommendations. Uh, also in Germany, it's very similar, but uh, in Germany, GRE scores have a lot more weightage, especially if you want to get into the good uh, technical universities here. Um, some universities do have German as a requirement, but uh, only basic levels like A1 or A2, depending on how intense the course is in uh, with respect to German. But um, 
As a chemical engineer, I would say it's it's helpful to learn the language uh, here in Germany because if you want to get jobs at the end of the day, German is a prerequisite pretty much in every um, chemical company if you're doing the core core stuff and not so much IT related business. So um, yeah, depending on the program, there will be certain different requirements for German levels in Netherlands. That's not the case pretty much, uh, but the procedure is pretty much same as that in the US. Okay, uh, Dr. So I wanted to ask, uh, like, uh, did you uh, like, did you specifically go for applying towards uh, universities in the US? And also, like, what were any steps that you could highlight uh, that were involved in the application process? Um, there was also one very specific question related to uh, the uh, University of Wisconsin that. Since they don't have an MS program, uh, are they more likely to accept PhD students that have lesser publications or not much research experience? Really good question. And I think the person who knows this, like, have done good <laughs> research on <laughs> knowing that this university does not accept MS students. And uh, frankly, that's the case with almost all all the top tier colleges of the US with the chemical engineering, which has good chem chemical engineering program. They all prefer uh, students to take for a PhD path rather than a master's path. They don't want to waste time, I think. <laughs> they just like want to train students for good fundamental research and like make them really good for other academic programs. Uh, so in terms of uh, application process, I think it's not very different from uh, Germany. You need GRE, you need TOEFL. TOEFL is a, I'm not sure if TOEFL is something which is required for European. Yeah, uh, it is as well. Yeah. And good GPA. Oh, yes. Good GPA. Uh, how much ever I stress that uh, it's important to be passionate about chemical engineering if you want to go with that path, you still need good GPA to get through these colleges. Uh, it's like for especially PhD, as I said, the, these top tier colleges do not accept any master students. So the it's it's already the the gem of all the different countries which are coming in here. There's like twenty students, where out of which ten might be international, and out of those tens, an Indian and American, uh, uh, Korean and Chinese, there are different nationalities which would come in. So you're just like one or two among those top tier colleges. The good part of us here, like being Bitsian, is one uh, very important that Bits is one of the top colleges in U in India. So they already take that into consideration, and uh, like the top people, the top U GPA students are who are taken into consideration for their applications. Publication. Uh, I'll tell you, for my case, I did not have any publication, but I did do good research. I had good internships, which I could explain. Uh, and the important part was what was the result of it. So I did have one small publication in a conference, as well as I had good research, which was I, which I did in uh, IIT during my third year internship, which really helped me to give my case, to provide my case in the application process that I have done enough research to back it up and say that I want to go in the next path. That means I want to go forward with a PhD in specific field. So uh, I think the two more two most important thing is yes gpa is very very crucial but it is also important to do some kind of research work in your third year projects either sops lops that we do in our college or through internships so that not just to know what really you like but also to provide your case during your statement of purposes which we write for making our case that they should accept us for our phd program Okay, all right. Um, my next question um, is that, uh, like, how did you decide your field of study comes to, uh, say, MS in case of Sneha and, like, PhD in case of uh, Shalaka? Like, uh, did you, and, like, while selecting these particular programs, did you give priority to the universities that you are applying to or the specific specialization that you're going for? So, Sneha, if you could start with it. Sure. So um, when I was applying for my master's, I think for me, the biggest uh, 
factor for considering a university was whether they have a thesis program, thesis based uh, masters or not. And uh, TU Delft, uh, and as most other European universities, offered a thesis based masters program. And for me, it was like, I do want to go for a PhD later on. So a good amount of research experience at the masters level would also be helpful. And so TU Delft had this. Um, whole second year basically devoted to a thesis and an internship, which I found to be the first crucial factor for me to choose the program here. Secondly, the chemical engineering program in Tudor was very, very well known and Tudor is like um, one of the Idea League universities. So Idea League is similar to the Ivy Leagues in the US, uh, just in Europe. Um, and Tudor is one of those and has a very good brand name and a good chemical engineering program. It's very, very intense, the program. As I said, it's divide, like you do all your coursework in the first year and the second year is just related, uh, left out for your internship and uh, thesis. And so um, when I looked into the structure of the program, what I was really interested in is doing a lot of material science and nanotechnology. And Tudor offered exactly that. They had a very specific track which offered uh, material science as a part of the chemical engineering program and um, and the opportunity to do a lot of research uh, per se. So uh, also the research group that I was interested for working with uh, was very much um, embedded in the chemical engineering department of the uh, of the university. So I thought, well, that's the best uh, best case for me where I can go there, do my research and, you know, gain enough experience going forward for my PhD. And that was really helpful for me. Um, also, because I was more keen towards working on renewable energy and most likely for like materials for energy applications. Tu Delft really had a good program for that. And, and that that was something that made me choose Delft and also my current, P I mean, the PhD that I eventually did. Sure. Okay. And Dr. Shalaka, like, uh, what made you choose, uh, um, like, what made you choose pursuing a PhD in chemical and biological engineering? So, uh, one thing you, if one would notice that in the chemical engineering departments in US, it's typically chemical and biological engineering, chemical and biochemical engineering. It's there in almost all the colleges, and there's a reason behind it. They always think that there is interdisciplinary research, which is which has value so it, there's no it, like in india it's chemical engineering departments you would not find that in us so it's typically the field that you choose chemical engineering and biological which you apply for you during your sop process you can specify that this is the exact field that i want to work in it could be catalysis it could be energy it could be materials systems there are four or five main fields but it all for some universities it boils down to when you arrive to that university you get into a rotational program basis uh so it can depend on university to university one thing which is very clear a uh, few of the universities allow students to come and choose their professors who they want to work with and few of the universities ask you to pick or find out or discuss with your professor beforehand before coming to from India to US and pick the right professor who you want to work with and have like starting discussions with them so that you get a few of the questions around the research field answered or as well as funding to be answered at that point. For me, it was different. It was about the rotational program basis, which I discussed the first point. So what you do is you arrive to that university and for the first month you get familiarized. Like you, you go talk to every professor. They have their five minute talk where they just tell you what they have done in the past and what they're looking for, which literally none of us understand <laughs> because they're so high level. <laughs> and then you start talking to them. They give you a few of their papers. You start reading them. And again, you don't understand anything. You go ahead and ask them questions. The whole point is they want to see your interest. They want to know what is your rule of thought? What do you think? How do you think? And also your interest. So all these things combined, if they see you as a potential, they can, then there is a process of like picking up which professor you want to choose as well as they do the same thing. You write a priority order and based on the match, they pick a professor for you. So if you're not, if you don't like the pick, if you don't like the order in which you got the professor list, then you can go ahead and say that I'm not interested in this particular professor and I want to look for other 
people to work with. And you can go ahead and look for people in the other departments too. That's the choice that was given in Madison. And I believe that's true in all the universities. You can pick the professor who you want to work with. The whole idea is that you go ahead and talk to them, show your interest, and see if their interest and your interest match. It's two different things of picking a professor and liking their in, liking their research as a, as well as liking their personality of that professor and working with them and that's also one important thing which is which plays a role in the later part of phd which i guess neha would also agree with yes <laughs> absolutely so i think i want to add a few more things here to highlight uh, a bit more about the process at tu delft so um, when you're applying to tu delft in the sop you're typically supposed to highlight three different research topics that you would be interested on in working in let's say as a part of your thesis in the second year but you don't have to be super concrete in that you can just talk very high level uh, once you come to the university, you have the choice to choose your own professor. So at the end of the first year, all professors from all research groups, they basically give you a presentation telling you about what mm -hmm. kind of research they've done. And you can go and choose. And here it's not a bit, not at all about match. You just go to the professor and tell them you want to work with them and they take you because the thesis is a very, very important part of the program. So the professors have to take you, even if they are fully overloaded with students, um, they do. So that way you have the choice to work with your professor, the kind of professor you want to work on, um, work with, and the kind of topic you want to work on is then decided together with the professor what based on your previous research experiences and your interests, of course. Um, it definitely helps if you've already taken courses with that professor and have done well, because then you tend to build up a good rapport with that person and over time then eventually if you do well in your master thesis uh, you might actually end up getting a PhD with him provided he has funding for a PhD position so that's how it works in Europe you don't really always end up in the same university doing a PhD depends really on the professor if he has funding or not and uh, a PhD is always funded in the in in Europe because uh, uh, it really depends on the grants that a professor has and gets. So you will never find an unfunded PhD there. If the professor doesn't have funding, they're just not gonna take you on a PhD and you have to apply elsewhere. And then applying for a PhD is a very normal process. There you don't need GRE and TOEFL, just your, uh, just your uh, master grades and recommendations from your professors and, and basically a CV. It's kind of like a job app, mini job application, which you have to send in for open PhD positions, but then you can be rest assured that the remaining three to four years of your life are completely uh, funded. <laughs> now, for me, the process was a bit different because um, I already knew the area that I wanted to work on. So initially I was quite interested in working with on fuel cells, but then I went to this professor and uh, this particular professor and he said, oh, you know what, I'm working on this topic and maybe I give you some of my papers and you take a look at it, you might be interested in this area. And that was an area called, um, Solar fuel, basically it means using solar energy to convert, uh, let's say split water into hydrogen and oxygen or convert CO2 into uh, other chemical fuels. And that was a very new and exciting field that was coming up. And uh, and I, when I read the papers, again, it was very high level, nothing that I understood at the beginning of my master's, but then eventually when I started reading more about it, it was very exciting. So um, I decided to go ahead and start working on that topic. And that ended up becoming also later on uh, the path that I chose for my PhD thesis okay sure and uh like could you guys recommend any online resources or uh like scholarships that one can look out for for financing their ms or phd um are there any programs available that you're aware mm -hmm. of yes, for yeah. delft i think for tu delft there's already an internal scholarship which is very very selective so Typically, when you're applying for TU Delft, you also apply for that scholarship, and then it's very selective, so you you may or may not get selected. Beyond that, for Netherlands, I'm not aware of any other scholarships, but for Germany, there are a lot of them uh, from DAD. So you um, so you can basically apply, and those are again selective, very much based on your GPA. So if you're a nine pointer, you have much higher chances of getting the DAD scholarships, but it's worth applying. Yeah. Shalaka, would you like to add something to that? In US, I would say, as far as I know as well, there are no specific scholarships which would fund your PhD or master's program. PhD, typically, I would not say all the time, but 60% of the time they are funded. You do get a stipend, which is enough for you to sustain uh, in your PhD life, have good standard of living. Uh, 
but the 40 percent of time you do have to find some way to fund yourself and usually that as far as i have seen other friends of mine who had looked for uh, scholarships they typically take three parts there are either you can become a research assistant or a teaching assistant or a project assistant that's that's three main ways people look for uh, scholarships or like fund fundings it's very hard to find that when you are in india looking for a professor so typically what students do is as soon as they come in the first day itself uh, they have discussions with their seniors and then like to know what who is really looking for a student and then they start just approaching them can you give me a teaching assistantship or a project assistantship or a research assistantship you need to work like 20 hours a week there's some uh, clause there how much you have to work and give time mm -hmm. and you decide with that professor or that uh, like the teacher who is teaching the class and then go forward with that yeah Sure. So okay. maybe I'll add a bit more uh, to this here. Uh, it, it works a little differently in the Netherlands and in Germany here per se. So in the Netherlands, beyond scholarship, you also have the possibility to obviously get these teaching assistantship, but not research assistantships. Uh, but they are usually there only for a semester or like only for a quarter or so and not not longer. Typically, the programs are so intensive that you cannot manage both. But if you can, I did a teaching assistantship in my second year for uh, one of the quarters. So it's possible to do that. Uh, again, you have a 20 hour working limit also in the Netherlands, but in Germany, it's a little more relaxed because um, the biggest uh, advantage in Germany is that you don't have tuition fees. All you have to pay is 600 euros in a year to register for the semester and your living expenses, basically, and that's it. So people are a little more free in terms of how long you can, um, you know, stretch your program. So a lot of students, what they tend to do is work alongside studying. It's called work student here. So basically you go to a company or you go to a research uh, institute and you work uh, parallel to your master's and that pays you money and you can finance your studies at your master's level through that. PhD is always 100% funded. So, and, and you really uh, don't have to worry about funding actually. So there are two ways you can have PhD funding. One is through these DAD scholarships, in which case you don't pay taxes in the country. And the other one is uh, funded positions where you actually are like an employee. You pay taxes on your salary and you get all the benefits of basically being, a, being an employee person in the, in the country. So um, especially in Germany and, and Netherlands, uh, the second variant is more common where you are pretty much like an employee and you pay taxes on your PhD salary. And that is also something that I would recommend if you're looking for a PhD in these countries, that you always ensure that you're not coming on a scholarship for a PhD, but uh, but more in as a research assistant where you get employed and you pay taxes on your um, on your monthly salaries because then you get a lot of unemployment benefits and pension benefits and so on and so forth, even later on in life, which is really quite helpful uh, beyond a scholarship because scholarship students don't get that. Sure. Okay. So, uh, uh, so next question is that how does the workload and work environment differ when you're pursuing higher education, MS, PhD uh, abroad as compared to like your bachelor study over here? So, Dr. <laughs> Shalaka, if you can go ahead. I think Sneha already started with her discussion that it's not the same. It's never the same. <laughs> Uh, so bachelors, I think we all know there was a big, uh, we, we never used to go to classes. That, that, <laughs> that's true with all of it seems. And if you start doing that here, I don't think it would <laughs> be helpful for a long run. So that's one thing which changes drastically, attending classes. So, and there are one, the one biggest, actually two biggest reason for that is the one of them is that the professor they if you are in one of these good universities and most of the good universities have these really high uh, highly expert people in their fields and frankly there had been so many such conversations where the professor is speaking something and i am just out of my world and like blown away with what he had given so that that kind of an experience you do not get if you don't attend classes that's one most important thing the second thing is assignments the life clearly changes when you come to us and assignments are very very important part of your curriculum uh, 
as Sneha said, in the US as well, uh, typically in the first year, first complete year, you are you do intensive uh, courses like they're, they're all advanced level chemical engineering courses, uh, which would require assignments weekly. And those assignments are not easy to do. They are, I think they are framed to fail you. <laughs> they're in a way framed to fail you. And they just give you problems which are right now out in the field, which kind of may be open. They might be open. They might also do not know the answers. There had been times when I have written a, assignment where the professor did not know the answer he was just trying mm -hmm. out and looking at students how they approach and he was getting an idea of how he can approach as well and that's totally okay and that's the whole point of assignments at this level that they want you to prepare yourself they want us yeah they want us to prepare and they want us to see how we think and how we can think for our next project as well because phd again it's going to be an open-ended work there's going to be a problem statement you have to approach it maybe through different 10 different angles and you're going to fail in nine that's <laughs> true that's true so yes it changes drastically bachelors it's it's not recommended when you come to us to not attend classes and yes do your assignments that's also very important that's where most of the learnings come from and it's a part it's part of the process it's a training that is very crucial for you it, it not just tells you to do something on time but it also tell prepares you the way to do these problems the way to approach these projects and like problem statements i would say okay yeah so i think in um, shalaka mentioned almost all the points in, in netherlands it was no different for us uh, what was very um, the starting, the stronger difference was the fact that we just had 10 weeks uh, to do a certain set of courses, let's say 15 credits in, in 10 weeks is quite intense to do. And then you have weekly assignments, as she mentioned, you have to do them. There are tutorials that you have to attend because beyond that, you will, you will fail your exams because exams are not just the only component that are responsible for your overall grade in the course. You also have grades for your assignments. And honestly speaking, if you do your assignments really well, you can get 80% of your grade from the assignments for the course. So essentially for the exam, then you have just 20% of the grade remaining, which you can actually manage to do because you've done your assignments regularly. So it's a lot about being regular with your studies, attending classes, and you know not cramming things up right before your exam because you just cannot survive with that. So that's how it works also here in the Netherlands. And I think it's a very, very rigorous training, but it's something that's really good for the future because it helps you to be consistent with your approach to, uh, to subjects, to studying, to solving problems. Yeah. I think we lost Sophia. <laughs> She's on mute, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah so uh, I wanted to ask Sneha that you did your both your masters and PhD. So what are the differences in the two? Also, we had a question similar to that. A PhD is heavily dependent on your advisor with whom you're working with. So does that play an important role? Uh, yes. So a research is always dependent on your advisor and his capabilities that I cannot emphasize enough. So you need to choose your advisor also wisely uh so for for in europe typically that's how it's structured you always do a master's first and then you go for a phd it's never an integrated program so your master's is typically as i said the first year is coursework and the second year is more research oriented with internships and then after that if you want to continue working with the same professor you go ahead with the same professor in the same group if he has funding if not you look for other phd options outside the latter was what i did because I had a specific topic in mind and that was not available in my research group and my professor did not have funding. So um, I decided to go ahead with a different research group. You have to interview with all the research groups uh, that you apply to for a PhD position and uh, basically see where, where you are a right fit, not just, not just within the group, where you get along with the advisor that you're interviewing with, but also where the topic is interesting enough for you to dedicate the remaining three to four years of your life um, so th that's pretty much how the structure works in Europe. Uh, you don't really apply to a direct PhD program unless you already have a master's, which is which means if you have a dual degree at BITS and you already have a master's in physics, then you can apply directly for a PhD program. 
for an open position, basically, um, anywhere. Um, but apart from that, if you don't, and if you just have a bachelor's, then, um, yeah, then you'd have to go through a master's and then apply for a PhD. Sure. Okay. Uh, Dr. Shalaka, do you have anything to add to that? Actually, in a way, this is, I, I think this is a good way of approaching for PhD. Going through a master's, you really get to know a lot more about the subjects and then, like, choose the professor, choose your interest. Right. As I said, bits, you don't like you do get some exposure to research, but that's nowhere near what is done here in either Europe or in US. So it's a master's have a lot of value there to choose a professor what for your PhD or thesis. But in US specifically, these integrated programs of direct PhD, they're designed for students do not waste time. That's what they refer to. For people, uh, they believe that for people who are from BITS or IIT, they have gone through this training. They know how to choose a professor, how to choose a field of your interest. They just assume that we are smart enough to <laughs> understand that. But uh, you do get time in the first year of, like the first semester of your uh, PhD, like the first part of it, where you go talk to professor, you're still learning the courses. So in the first couple of months, you get a small hint of like, what do you like transport? Yes or no? Do you like catalysis? Is it something which is very difficult for us to like understand? Mm -hmm. So like you, you would get at least directional in interest. You would understand that part of it. So I think take your, the most important, in my opinion, for me, the PhD, the most important, uh, phase was the first year of PhD where it was the steepest curve. You have to give yourself enough uh, time to learn and it's too much of knowledge out there. So take it slowly, <laughs> mm -hmm. but don't stop. Like keep on yeah. learning. The, the first year is the hardest time. So mm -hmm. <laughs> also, I think maybe what one thing as a, as a small piece of advice, maybe Shalaka will agree or disagree with me here, but uh, often people tend to pursue really high and famous professors, you know, at universities, like go to their labs and stuff. It's not something I would particularly recommend doing. The reason being when you are in your PhD, you're also learning and you need this constant interaction with your professor to learn and grow. And most of the time, these high end professors or these famous professors don't have so much time for you to and you're left alone swimming in an ocean with high high currents and and at some point you will think that you're drowning because you just don't have enough support so i would say rather choose a professor who's a mid-level who's still growing he has the need to grow because he's on a tenure track maybe or he's just wants to grow his lab and therefore he needs to show that he's able to you know supervise his students better that way you will also have a good learning experience so i can tell you personally my phd experience was great because the the person i was directly working with in a research institute and that's again another difference i'll just come to shortly so um the person i was working directly on a day-to-day -day basis he was a guy who was a senior scientist in the lab he's been there he had a uh, he was there since the past three or four years. He had some really good grants that he had under his belt. And he was supervising my PhD on a day-to-day -day basis. My main PhD advisor, the guy who was supposed to examine my thesis, he was like all sorts of big shot in my field and he did not have time. But luckily enough for me, I had this, this guy, the senior scientist in my lab who was, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, he knew the subject matter so well that for him, it was easier to comprehend, to give me advice, to, you know, have this uh, fruitful interaction, which would help me move ahead in my PhD with my PhD advisor per se. I never had any fruitful interactions beyond, okay, how are the papers coming along? How many papers do you have on the pipeline? <laughs> and that, that, that's usually how you're going to have it, you know, when you have big professors on the panel, but try to go for ones who are really striving to go to the tenure track or striving to get grants because and, and su supervise PhD students for what they are and not like because I'm a high high end professor or something of that sort. Mm, and that being said, it's uh, now I would come to the point that in Europe, you don't do a PhD always at a university. You also work at a research institute like Max Planck or Helmholtz. And I, I'm not sure how many of you have heard of it, but there are these research institutes which do dedicated research. The professors there are usually a part of some university. They're affiliated to a university which will eventually give you your PhD degree, 
but you do your whole research work, not in the university, but in the research institute, which makes your PhD program a bit shorter. You can do it within three years. I did my PhD in three and a half years, uh, so, but in the university, because you have teaching assistant responsibilities and so on, the PhD can extend to four to four and a half, five years along the path. So that's also one other major difference between US and Europe. Yeah. I, I haven't heard of something like this in US. No, they, it's not there, no. yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so uh, US basically only has universities which for PhD, right? The universities offer PhD and then you can actually have a project which is funded from a research institute. But it's, yes, as you're, you're totally correct that it's usually university which offer PhD programs. All right, okay. Yeah. So uh, moving on, uh, so this question is for Shalaka. Like you're currently you're working as an extrusion scientist at Dupont. So and you pursued a PhD in chemical and biological engineering. So like, uh, how did it affect your chances of getting that uh, position? And what exactly is the work of an extrusion scientist? <laughs> I have. I'm still figuring it out. I haven't start done too much of work in that field. It's it's completely new for me as well. So the first fundamental uh, point here is a PhD in chemical engineering does not define what your job would be. It is about the process. You learn how to approach a problem. You are not learning about the, uh, I, let me put it out this way. You're not just solving one problem. You're just understanding how to solve a problem. And for that particular, particular uh, skill set, that's why you are taken into a job per se. Like for example, this extrusion scientist, in short, I am a research scientist who is supposed to be an expert in extrusion. And for people who do not know about extrusion, extrusion is just mixing and heating. It's it's process engineering, more or less. And I work on food part of it. Like this, it's very, very less related to chemical engineering. So uh, my thesis was specifically in biomaterials. And that's how they thought that, oh, this is something related to food. So let's just take her into this job. <laughs> uh, but uh, the idea is that I learned about how to solve one problem in my PhD. This is why they took me in this job, because they know I can solve problem. I know the skill set. I know the approach. And I can apply the same thing in a different application. Now it's not chemical related problems, but it's food related problems. And food is completely different world. So as I said, I'm still learning about the process. I didn't, I don't, I know enough about extrusion, but I don't know enough about food in general. So I'm still learning that part of the world. But uh, again, it's the approach. I, they have given me a problem statement. I'm trying to understand it and solve it based on my experience. Yeah, sure. Uh, and when you say, like, how did you end up applying for the job? Like, uh... it, okay, so jobs here, uh, I think this is one of the questions which people would ask, considering how difficult it is getting here to get jobs for any Indian national or any non-American student in US. Uh, the, there are, I agree, there are fewer jobs now available because of the change in H-1B processes but uh, there still are and the best way to approach for jobs is through uh, networking you attend conferences you discuss with your professor or if they know of other people who know if they have any job openings uh, you discuss with friends your alumni uh, different companies where they, these alumni have gone to. So it's all about networking and approaching them and asking them for a job referral. That's the most important thing. Your job application can sit in a pile of thousand other job resumes and it would, even though it's the best of it, it would never go on the top because you do not have a referral. So here it is more important to know the right person who you should ask to and uh, then ask them to refer you and that would bring you on the top of the pile. And that's when they start going through the interview process. For me, it was the person who I had, I was writing a book chap chapter with a with one of the ex professor from our lab. And uh, while I was writing uh, this chapter, I got to know that she worked in the same company. 
she worked in DuPont here and we had the same research area. We started talking about it and I'm, she's like, are you looking for a job? And I'm like, yes, please. <laughs> and that's how I ended up in this job. Sure. Okay. And uh, Dr. Sneha, so you did your PhD and your master's in chemical engineering. And so what made you take up consulting and what, like, when you talk about being a consultant, what does your work entail? Does it, is it very something very specialized to your profile? Or did you have to apply, uh, prepare separately for that? Okay, so I'm going to take up the question in two steps. So I guess the first is how did I actually end up as a consultant after chemical engineering? And I have to say, I have my boyfriend to thank for it. Um, so when I was in the final year of my PhD, I I was kind of, uh, I really liked doing research and I still, I think I still like doing it as well. But the point being, I was not quite happy with the way academia was shaping up. It was more like a vicious cycle of publish or perish. Uh, we wrote this particular grant uh, in the final year of my PhD and the grant got rejected. We asked for a detailed feedback and he said, oh, well, the, the idea is amazing. The idea is very, very innovative, but uh, you don't have enough first author articles. And I was like, okay, but if I don't have the grant, I don't have a chance to do a first author publication. <laughs> And it turned out like it's going to be just a very vicious cycle. And every time as you go ahead in your career in academia, it's always that. It's either a grant or a, or a publication that stands on your way. And that, that's what shapes up your career in academia. And, and then there was a second point in my, in my time during the PhD. I was working as a part of this European consortium. Our project was funded by the European Commission. And before the Steerco meeting happened, I realized that we had academicians in our consortium and we had some companies, some small medium enterprises that we were working with. And the company people, they were like, what is the economic impact of your work? And the professors were like, we don't care about the economic impact. What we want is more publications to end up in journals. And I was like, wow, that is not a thought process I'm willing to accept. I mean, I am not going to accept the fact that I write something and no one reads it for years to come. And probably this research is just going to end up in a pile of journal somewhere and no one's going to ever see the light of it and that's when i thought well what i need to do in the next step of my career is really do something that has a real tangible impact in the real world that you can see actually and because my research was very interdisciplinary like i could use my knowledge in a lot of places i could because i was doing renewable energy and i had some uh, some association with battery materials and so on and so forth i thought well i could go to the automotive sector and work on e-mobility and doing their battery uh, related research or i could actually even go to a clean tech company i could i could possibly be in every company and i was like I don't know what to do as which company should I go for? And uh, my boyfriend was back then and he was like, uh, he was working for McKinsey and he said, well, you know, I see you have a lot of interest in economics and, and you do have a very strong scientific focus. Why don't you try out consulting? And I was like, how does it even relate to what I do? Are they going to even take PhD students like me? That was my first question. And, and then he was like, well, I'm a lawyer. I did a PhD in law. I have nothing to do with consulting and I'm still working here. And that's how I got exposed to consulting in the first place. And then I attended a few events from McKinsey. So McKinsey and BCG and Bain, they tend to organize a lot of events for uh, graduate students here. Um, and I attended one of these events where they were trying to actually advise a chemical client um, and it was a hypothetical case scenario where they were advising a chemical client to launch a new product in the market. And it was really exciting as a problem statement because it was not a science problem statement. It was a business problem statement. But as a chemical engineer or a chemist, I found a lot of, I would say, fundamental connection to this problem statement because I was the only one in the team who really understood what the product was all about and where it could have applications and how it could help the business go. Oh. And, and that's when I realized that as PhDs, as scientists, we have that advantage that we can relate to the particular products a company introduces in the market and actually help develop business strategies to bring that product into the market successfully and grow the company. And that for me was a very, very tangible impact, you know, like the kind of work that you do in consulting for a company that you're advising, you might see to two months down the line or two years down the line, the share prices of that company going up. And that is because of a strategy that you designed for the company that they've managed to implement. The only thing is because you have a scientific background, you have a lot of, you can talk to the CEOs of the company at the same level because you can really understand their products, something that only MBA graduates don't, don't really get here. And 
when I looked more into it, I was very fascinated by the whole idea of being able to advise top level executives and bring in my technical knowledge there and tell them, well, I do understand your product and I think this is how you should go ahead with it and, you know, grow your company and so on and so forth. And that's why I thought of um, doing consulting moving forward because I really wanted to uh, to kind of round up my profile, not just with the technical knowledge, but also a bit of the business part of things, because in the long run, I thought if I wanted to move out of academia, I would definitely want to be, you know, in a decision making position for for a technical company which would you know eventually help to bring some tangible impact in the society as well as in the economy and um, yeah that's where i ended up uh, i had attended a few events from kinsey i attended some events in Bain. the major question was as women can we actually do consulting because consulting is a very intensive lifestyle you're working pretty much 13 14 hours a day you're traveling four days a week and you're only home three days three nights and I was like, yeah, what happens in the long run as a woman, you also need to have a family and, and something. And how do you balance all of this? And there were a lot of events, a lot of insights that I got. And um, I had a mentor from the university who was a Bain consultant back then. And with her help, I was able to actually submit applications and, and I managed to actually get into get into Bain from there. But I also need to mention here that uh, German was a big requirement for all the consulting firms in Germany because Obviously, they serve a lot of German clients and I had to learn German. I had no clue about German, like zero before 2017. I could not speak German. I could not understand German. But then eventually, end of 2017, I started learning. And let's say within nine months, I was able to get from zero to, to a native level speaker enough to be able to do my interviews. Uh, and that really helped. That, um, in my opinion, really helped to put in that much work and really get to where I am today. And coming to the second part of your uh, question, what exactly my work entails? Um, at the very initial stages, it entails a lot of data analysis, a lot of hypothesis development. And I think that is exactly where the similarity with PhD comes in and why they take PhD students. Um, we have a lot of, we have a very strong problem solving and analytical ability. We don't often tend to realize that, but we are the kind of people who can break down unstructured problems into very small problem statements and solve them by developing hypotheses for it. And then, you know, designing our experiments and analyzing the data, getting insights out of it. And that's exactly the process that consulting follows. You, you have a big problem statement, you have to develop, you have to really break it down into smaller sub questions and structure and in a structured fashion, move through to basically generate an answer for the client. And you have to always be hypothesis driven in order to be efficient with your time and to know how you wanna go ahead. And that is where the expertise here comes in. And what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is basically at the initial stages, develop hypotheses, gather data, analyze data, and actually develop insights for the client and recommendations in terms of what they could do, for instance, to launch a product, new product in the market and how they could grow. Uh, it's it's very different from the bench work that you do in the lab, I would say. It's less hands-on, more in front of the computer, sitting and preparing presentations and trying to figure out what you what you would recommend or what you would communicate to the CEO of a company. But it's, um, it's an equally, uh, I would say, valuable experience because uh, beyond your problem-solving skills that you get to hone, um, it's a very fast-paced environment. You have a project that goes on for three months and then you're off to a new project. So you get to learn constantly. The learning curve is so steep, you will not find that in academia. So um, I think it, it's something that's really, um, really cool and um, nice for people who have varied interests and who are not sure which area they wanna go for and have equal interests in economics and business. Sure, okay, so we have a question in the chat. Um... Someone has asked that in the corporate world, it is a general trend to change job profile every three years. Is this trend also prevalent in the research field? And if what, if yes, what other jobs are considered? I think uh, if I understand this question right, it means jobs uh, which are related to research, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. Jobs. Okay, I think uh, I would say at least as far as I know of people who are working in different companies after getting a PhD as like research scientists, they typically don't tend to change companies this often uh, un until unless there is 
the company is not doing well if they're firing people or something like that other than that i don't see this trend in specifically research related uh jobs uh it, it's a it's frankly in my job i would say it's more like a postdoc which i'm doing i have a problem statement which is given and because i already know the process as sneha said the hypothesis driven approach you already know that process you are applying it in a different job and it and again the projects are short short uh, lived maybe like an year less than a year uh, and you're working on multiple problems uh, but there's so much to learn in the company as well that it ta- it takes more than 3 years for you to really digest and learn all aspects of it i haven't s- and especially corporate world in general it keeps on changing as well there are times like with with difference in economy there are different products for example for dupont itself they are changing from uh, specifically like initially there was much uh, growth in the specific food items now it's more about high protein diet and then eventually there's more about f- pet foods i'm being very specific here but yes it's it with the changing world it's different problem statements that you get in different applications so i i haven't seen many people changing job profiles when they are in the research field specifically but it's again it's not unheard of because they get good opportunities if they see for example this high protein diets there are so many new companies who are coming up here with good products like uh, if in us there are there's a thing called impossible burgers that's uh, it's like a non meat eating burger mm-hmm. uh, so everyone is just crazy about it and everyone wants to work for that company so yeah if if they do offer a job why not <laughs> one would really want to work in a company which is doing really good right so something like that people do tend to go from one company to other just for the sake of uh getting exposure from one of the best companies but typically in research field that's less unheard of like yeah i think it's more likely to happen uh when you're less on a hands on research side but more on uh let's say a management uh kind of side like doing product management or product development even as phd's you can do product development and end up yeah. going into product management right so uh, or even application development there are a lot of application field engineers and application scientist um, positions these are the kind of positions where you would see people changing jobs uh, let's say once every 3 years or once every 2 years because they would say okay we worked on this application maybe we can take this expertise and go to another con- company with a better uh, salary better pro- career progression and and do the same thing and and that's exactly where you will see a lot of people changing jobs uh, yeah. in that kind it's of more thing. application driven i guess yeah exactly yes uh, not so much in a postdoc kind of setting in the companies yeah mm. sure okay so uh, like in continuation with this uh, someone has asked uh, that uh, like uh, what are some other alternate industry career options that one can pursue after a phd uh in a chemical engineering field and uh, do they have to learn any additional skills to apply for these jobs people often think that as a phd we don't have enough skills beyond the technical knowledge but i have to emphasize on the fact that we do have a lot of soft skills that are very easily transferable to industry careers so the typical route that a lot of people take is obviously r and d but you can also as i said go into developing applications go into uh, really technical consulting roles where you can actually consult companies on more more on a more technical side of things rather than their strategies um obviously in the us and in europe uh, it's very common for phd students also to go into con- also to go into consulting like strategy consulting with mckinsey bcg bain and the likes uh beyond that uh product development product management is also something um that that is considered uh by phd's often um and these are typically uh quite dynamic industry careers that you would have uh, rather than just um just an academic career in 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 research yeah i think uh, she summed up really well this the consultancy jobs are what much looked after these days in uh, us as well for phd students and it's all about as i said the approach you learn we have good skills we and 
The other part is that we know how to learn something. So that's also useful. That's the most important part. Uh, you don't know, uh, as a PhD student, you would realize you don't know all the problems. You don't know all the solutions to the problem, let's say that. And, but you know how to solve them. You know what has to be done, the small statements that you have to define, small problems that you have to define to reach that final problem statement. So it's, we have the skills. It's, it's about which place you want to go and apply it. You can be in a research position. You can be a product developer, a consultant, postdoc, if academia is the path that you want to follow, which a lot of people after PhD do think about that. Uh, I have a few of my friends who are working at Google or uh, the other IT companies as well because they value their, uh, their process, their thinking, that, that hypothesis-driven thinking as well. So... It's, it's not unheard of. There are a lot of opportunities for PhD students. They are only looking for how you think and how you approach a problem rather than what problem you solve. So maybe one other interesting um, career aspect for PhD students is also to go into investment banks. And I'll tell you why. Because um, a lot of times what investment banks tend to do is develop these IPOs for big companies who are getting listed, right? And each of these companies need to be analyzed. And most of the times you will notice among all the people who are analysts over there analyzing this particular company, they are called equity analysts. They often have a PhD in natural sciences, especially if it's a biotech company or a chemical company or, or, or any technical company. You know, They always tend to have one PhD on the team who's on the side, done some kind of CFA charter or something, and I've now become equity research analyst. That is also very much a possible uh, way of landing up. Also, if you have a good, let's say, coding skills, for instance, like you, you know, you worked a lot with Monte Carlo simulations and so on and so forth. That is also something uh, quite sought after in, in investment banking. You really don't necessarily um, have to always stick to um, the traditional scientific career paths here as yeah. PhD. I've seen few of my friends going into scientific writing as well. That's that's other yes. writing skills which you learn really well, writing your papers, which sometimes get published. <laughs> so that's one place you can actually get into as well if you are very much yeah. passionate about writing too. Absolutely. There Absolutely. are plethora of Absolutely. options. Yeah. I mean, you just need to choose at some point after your PhD where you want to go, but there exactly. are so many options that open up for you. And especially in countries like, you know, in the US or even in the European countries, the options are not limited. It's like, you know, when you're in India, people will say, you know, you've done a PhD, you have to go become a professor in the university. McKinsey, BCG, Bain are not even going to look at you in India because you've not studied MBA at a B school there. Mm -hmm. You have no experience under your belt. But trust me, here you are very sought after as a PhD in all fields. Yeah. Sure. Okay, so, uh, so uh, another question that we got in our Google form was that will one or two years of work experience say relevant to chemical engineering at a decent company in getting a better MS or PhD admit? Uh, Dr. Sneha, if you could take that up. Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, depends, I would say. It is not a mandatory thing, but you can definitely uh, go ahead and work for a couple of years. Um, in in you in um, Europe, typically at least in Germany, because I said there is this possibility to work alongside your uh, masters as a work student. Um, having a job um, experience under your belt is definitely some, a selling point that you can use to get that position, and then finance your own studies. But it's not mandatory. It is absolutely not mandatory. It will not, uh, let's say, make or break your application. What really matters is the area that you have interest in that you have enough experience in that field to show or enough knowledge to show in that field. Okay, so I think in US it's the other way around or maybe specific high tier uh, universities like maybe top one or two tier university, it's a different case. Uh, so typically for programs which uh, take uh, students directly, the integrated PhD programs, as far as I understand, they do not like students having a work ex. Uh, and that's to do with the fact that they think that students after doing their work, like working for a couple of years, they get into certain way of thinking, certain kind of training. And they don't, they don't want them to use that same training or 
change that method and apply it for PhD. Uh, they like having taking students who are fresh from undergrad and training them for a large, like a five-year course, five-year PhD program. That's how that's that's how much I understand about Madison and other uh, like Minnesota and other top tier universities which do take chemical engineering uh, PhD students. Uh, I think it has to do with uh, different fields. Like if you if you talk about this question in electronics or computer engineering, you might find the answer that yes, they do like having work ex in that area. But uh, the research in specifically these uh, chemical engineering, uh, like the, the top tier colleges, they are more fundamentally driven. Like the problems that they're solving are less application, which as Sneha pointed out, the economics part, they don't think about it. They're more just, really just focusing on what's the fundamental of the problem that, that they have to solve. And because of that, they typically don't like having a work ex for like a student who has gone through the work experience of maybe typically two or three years. Mm -hmm. But again, it, it's it's not unheard of. There had been a lot few of my friends in the universities who had have uh, done job for two or three years and then still got a PhD admit. Uh, it's uh, this. Uh, it also had to do with the kind of job they were doing. If they were doing some research related job or something to do with chemical engineering and good uh, chemical engineering where they were doing some process engineering work or uh, similar and they can explain why they relate that work experience to this new research that they want to take in then it's still plausible that they can get into good app like good phd program but it's the i in as far as i understand they like having students with less work experience but more research experience okay so um i guess we can uh, wrap up is there anything else you guys want to uh, add um, anything that you felt was not mentioned in the questions and you would like to tell people? Mm, from my side, I think what I would say is if it's at least if you're applying in Europe, um, it really doesn't matter in the sense whether you have a work experience or not. Eventually, what really matters is whether you have an interest in the subject and in terms of the curriculum per se, it's definitely quite intensive. So if you are if you are applying, you have to be very very sure that this is something you want to do and you want to commit yourself to, and, and you need, really need to strive to sustain in that in the universities because it's just super intensive to uh, to do that. So uh, like if you want to uh, pursue uh, a career in the industry in the long term, I think work experience would definitely help. At least the people I know. Here, my peers who've had a work experience, I had none. Um, they have had better chances of getting a job in the industry because of their prior work experience and industry knowledge. So that definitely helps, even after a PhD, if you don't, if you want to get into the industry. I mean, mm -hmm. so that's something to be considered. I mean, depends. Obviously, it's everything has its pros and cons. It's something that you have to weigh. What I can say is um, is the fact that uh, it's definitely financially not a big burden to study in Europe, especially in Germany. The job prospects for chemical engineers and material scientists are immensely good, especially because I know that in the US there are a lot of issues with visa, getting H-1B visa. Some companies also require uh, probably permanent residence and so on and so forth. Uh, but in, the, in Europe, you don't have that. All you need is a language probably in some companies, but it's not a big thing to learn. So uh, I would say in terms of bureaucracy, there is nothing that's stopping you from getting a job. Literally all my friends I know, or all my juniors I know, they all have decent jobs in, in good chemical companies like ExxonMobil or ExxonMobil or Dow, for instance, and, and they're all doing good for themselves. So, um, I mean, mm -hmm. Netherlands, Germany, Belgium, this, this is the belt for uh, chemicals and material sciences, uh, if, if that's something you're looking forward to in the future. Okay, so uh, Shalaka, if you have anything, also one more question. Someone has asked if like GRE and TOEFL scores are both required for PhD applications in US. Right, uh, I might have not answered the question perfectly. So uh, this 
for the application process in uh, USA for PhD, you do need GRE and TOEFL score. Uh, and it's, so for PhD, it's not a very hard limit that you have to get good GRE, like not 325 or 330 or something like that. It, it's not a it's not a hard limit. I did not have a good GRE score. I had like 322, something like that, which wasn't really very, very good score. So it's important to get like good enough score, which could be 320 plus for uh, for GRE. TOEFL as well, 100, 110 should be a good score. Uh, the most important part, I think, is the writing part, the AVA I, I, I think it is called AVA. Uh, there's a writing section which has two uh, two essays that you have to write, an argumentative and mm -hmm. I can't remember. Sorry, it's been too long. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, so that writing section was one of the most important part. You at least should have 3.5 or above uh, for that section. Uh, but again, these three are like the 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 first criteria to eliminate students. It won't be the deciding criteria for you to take up, take for this, like for them to select you for this PhD program. It's a, it's going to boil down to your SOPs and your CGPA. And your, again, SOPs, if you can explain your research experience, and if you have some publication or some conference proceeding or somewhere to signify that there has been a result, some tangible result of your research that you have done in your bachelor's that's the most important part uh, I think other than that uh, for specifically in general like summing up this uh, research like PhD approach uh, talk to your seniors that's most important keep on uh, networking with people know what they their process had been they are the best resources for you more or less everyone Every Bitsy and I know of has been helpful and for me to decide and come here. And it's typically uh, good faith. Everyone would go ahead and do that for their juniors as well. So don't don't hesitate. Just connect them on LinkedIn, ask them on Facebook groups, or just reach out to them on Facebook one on one. And they can help you out to know what exactly the process is. I have read a multiple a lot of SOPs. Of a lot of my uh, juniors so I can help them understand which professor might be the best work, best one for them to work with right deciding which kind of field they want to work with so all these questions you can direct them to your seniors and they might know the right approach for you to, to go with so that's my first advice uh, second advice is don't be scared that there are less jobs in US that's why I do not apply for PhD program or MS programs don't be scared about it it's it's a good training that you go through it's an intensive training as well but uh don't be scared about the fact that the the next part of the journey might be unclear there are as i said there are plethora of options that you can go for it's not just the r d scientists that one has to choose that path consultancy scientific writing there's so many other ways you can make use of your phd so don't be scared of it and uh I think, uh, uh, right, as I said, approach your seniors. They are very helpful. They like giving, they like talking. <laughs> as they like hearing advice. <laughs> that they, they have gained a lot of uh, lot of learning in these last five, six years. So they would be really helpful to tell you what's right and wrong and how to approach. Yeah, and I think BITS has a very, very wide network of alumni. I mean, being personally part of the BITS alum team, I know yeah. that in Europe as well, there are plenty of people in different European countries, right from Norway all the way down to um, down to France and Germany. So feel free to reach out to people. Don't be, don't be so hesitant. Just cold call people. Just write to people on LinkedIn, even if you don't know them, and just tell them, hey, I'm a junior. I'm in this year, blah, 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 studying this. And I'd like your advice. And I don't think anybody would say no to giving advice. I think that's something I've learned uh, by leveraging my contact when I was applying for consulting jobs where I just cold, coldly approached people and said, hey, I want to know what BCG does. In which, and, and people were happy to talk to me, although they did not know me personally. So I think leverage your seniors to the, to the biggest uh, possibility. And that should definitely help you get a lot of insights and prepare yourself for the next step after your bachelor's. 
if master's and PhD is the next step you're looking forward to. There are quite a lot of questions here on the chat as well. Yeah, and I see there's a new question about how do you get research internships and how hard is it to get ad admits for master's in Europe? compared to US and what factor should you choose? So maybe I can probably start off with the first question and give my insights on the second one to a bit. So for research internships, I've had some experience uh, with that in my third year and because I've done a lot of research internships myself, I can say just find professors in areas that you're interested in and write to them. Just you, you will not get re responses half the time, probably, <laughs> but just write to professors. In, if you want to do research internships in Germany, it's even easier because there are DAD scholarships. So a lot of professors look for, you know, DAD fellows in the labs. I write to professors and tell them, hey, I find your research interest area extremely interesting. I'm studying this in this year. And in the future, I want to focus on this. Um, I'd love to get an internship in your lab for three to six months. Professors usually like it if you go for a bit of a longer period of time. You know, like you can say, I'm going to do my bachelor's thesis or something in the, in the lab or master thesis. I don't know. But uh, just write to professors. It's often a cold email that you write to professors. I've written tons of cold emails. I've I've received no response most of the time. Sometimes I did receive responses. Um, and sometimes professors have responded saying, I don't have funding in the lab, but you can still come and work in my lab. In that case, it's not so beneficial, of course, for you as a student coming in from India. But if professors do have funding in the lab, they're more than happy to take you. So write to them, just find out, reach out to your seniors again, network with them, seniors who are currently doing PhD or working as a research assistant in the labs currently. Just reach out to them, ask them if their professors have any positions for, you know, thesis students or internship students. And that's exactly how you're going to get. Beyond that, there is also this thing called MyTax. I'm not sure if any people are aware of that, but MyTax is for research internships in Canada. Um, and you can apply there as well. Obviously, GPA requirements are very high, almost all the time, more than nine. So for those who have that GPA, you're at luck with that and MyTax. But beyond that, for those who don't and who think, oh, my GPA is between seven and nine, what am I going to do? My life is going to shit. That's not the case. You can just write to professors and most of the time they're just happy to take you in if you can show that you have, you know, interest in their research area and you have some experience or at least something that you've done, studied, et cetera, that might help you, um, that might help them leverage your expertise to a certain extent. That being said, uh, regarding masters in Europe and what factors to choose, um, well, financial factors, I have to emphasize, guys. Financially, mm -hmm. Europe is much, much better off, especially if you want to just do a master's and you're not sure about a PhD. It's financially less burden, less burden than, than US. That goes without saying. Um, also, for a PhD, you for a sure shot thing, you will have always 100% funding. There is no chance that you're not going to get funding for your PhD. In the US, I know there are sometimes positions which are non-funded. That's similar also in the UK, but uh, other countries in Europe, like Netherlands and Germany, will definitely always have funding. So that's something you should really consider, like how much you want to financially burden yourself. Beyond that, I would say look through the programs. Look really carefully through the programs, what kind of coursework, what kind of thesis research, who are the professors? Are there interesting research groups at the university that you're applying to where you really want to work, you know? In the future, those are the kind of things you really have to look into, because if it's a coursework that you're not very keen on pursuing if there are no research groups in the university that interest you you might have a problem pursuing the program later on that being said you can also ask seniors who are currently in those universities like in germany you will find seniors at rwth aachen and tu munich and so on and so forth where you can reach out to them and ask them if there's a possibility now what what are the chances and what are the job prospects after graduation and also you know, there's a possibility to do internships and thesis within companies in Europe, like even companies offer PhD thesis, master thesis and so on. So figure out all of these prospects, talk to a lot of your seniors and choose wisely. That's all I would say. I think uh, for me, it's so for the first question, how do you get research internships? I feel that's I that is referring to internships in your undergrad, if I understand it right. Yeah. So. DAD is one, my tax is the other one. I think the third one, which I, for US, is the Korana internship, Korana program. And it's also, it's called Bo Scholars. That's that, I remember when I was in Hyderabad, Bits Hyderabad, and that was my first year when they started that program. So it's a student exchange 
uh, from US as well as India. And uh, they are looking for scholars in not just chemical, but also biological, biomedical engineering. And uh, again, you need good CGPA and good experience, research experience. And they pick you uh, based on those factors and you can apply it through your professor as far as I remember. That's one of the best, best uh, exposure that you can get in US before arriving to US or before applying to US for your PhD. So do look up for the Korana program if uh, you haven't. It's it's one of the good places, good uh, research internship program that uh, a lot of universities offer. Other than that, they, they do cover uh, all your living expense when you're here on your internship. You get good enough uh, stipend that is uh, that keeps you like that that's enough for you to survive in us considering the high costs here uh so that's one i think dad my tax is the other one and again if they don't have scholarship that doesn't mean that you cannot get an internship you can apply through professors you can write them and ask them if they have any positions if they can fund you if not maybe not fund you but if they can provide you a position for you to do some research and funding, it is a difficult question to ask when it comes to US. You need uh, you need to be financially sound because you need to fund your visa as well if you are going through the master's program and if the pro professor is not able to fund you. So uh, yeah, research internship, look up Dad, my tax and Quran and keep on writing emails. It's, <laughs> I can't there focus less on that. plenty of programs within India. I think there are plenty of uh, summer scholar, summer resource scholar programs in India. I personally did my master, uh, my bachelor thesis at TIFR. It's it's a really, really good institute for a lot of people. Um, look out, just write to professors. I yeah. happened to write to professors and uh, my professor at TIFR, he offered me the position to do work in nanomaterials. And you have research labs like NAL, NCL, just look up there as well. It doesn't have to necessarily be an international research internship. It is good if it's international because you can show some international experience on your CV already. But if it's not, you can always reach out to professors in India and, and write to them and see if they have programs or positions or if there are scholarships. And there are. So yeah. there is nothing to be worried about. You will find plenty of opportunities. It's, it's really not a big deal. I think one last piece of advice before we all go, and I think Shalaka will agree with me on this regarding MS and um, uh, PhD applications. You do need recommendations. I would specifically mention take recommendations from people who can give you a strong one, not a neutral <laughs> one. No HOD. If you've not worked with the HOD of your department, don't just get recommendation for him for the sake of getting a recommendation. It doesn't help guys. Get something that's strong with people you work with who really can evaluate your work in an honest way. And I think that will really help your chances of getting getting in. Actually, you did point out a very important fact, which I, which we missed in our conversation. But recommendation Absolutely. letters are very, very important part of the application process. As I said, the first part is the GRE TOEFL. That's the first elimination round. Second is your uh, CGPA and SOP. But Again, the third and the most important part is the recommendation. And they are looking for good recommendations. They're looking for the right people as well as strong, like positive recommendation rather than, as she said, neutral. They, they don't want you to just say that, oh, she took a course in this <laughs> subject, which I taught. But they need to tell something different about you. They need to see that you're different from other people. And that can come out only because of the credentials that these professors have when they speak out in their recommendation letters. Exactly. So don't really always go for the position of the professor. However high ended he might be in your department, go for someone who can give an honest opinion about your uh, and a positive opinion, of course, about your work. Yeah. That will definitely right. be a lot more valuable than just taking a random HOD's mm -hmm. recommendation, which I know a lot of my peers did back then. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't recommend doing that. Right. Sure. So I think we can wrap up. Thanks a lot, guys. Like most of the questions in the chat have been addressed before. So uh, we'll be uploading our, uh, uh, uploading this video on YouTube and you guys can check it out over there. Thank you so much um, uh, for taking out the time and effort to do this. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank it was a pleasure so seeing all of you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. All the Bye. best. Bye. 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 All the best.